Let's get Mom going. Refusal's avatar is amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> um, so, hello, oh, and thanks for being here at the final edition of our Conversations on AI series. Today, Reza Nagarastani, Matt Dryhurst, and Jay Springett will be talking for about an hour and a half about Holly Plus, artificial pop stars, AI personhood, and much more. And we'll have time for questions and answers from the audience. First, I'm going to kick things off with a few words from my absent fourth panellist, Holly Herndon, who's unfortunately unable to join us, reflecting on our absent fifth panellist, Holly Plus. And we'll have some music from Holly Plus. Now, that was, of course, meant to be followed by me uh, playing excerpt from the video that I hope that you've all just um, <laughs> that you've all just watched. So let's just imagine that that was, you know, slotted in here and you've enjoyed the performance and the reveal is Matt uh, singing as Holly Plus, which I found quite new, strange and moving, I have to say, when I first watched that. Uh, in a way that I couldn't quite put my finger on, but uh, it was quite wonderful. Um, then I wanted to just say this as well, that Holly mentions elsewhere in that lecture performance. When I think about this technology and what it enables, I find it useful to look to historical precedent. But I like to think about this as a next generation of sampling, or as we like to call it, an homage to spawn, spawning. So spawning is the generation of child sounds from parent training data, the ability to perform as someone else based on trained information about them, which is very different from sampling. Just as sampling opened up a whole world of eth ethical questions, so does spawning. How to develop an entirely new legal framework to deal with this new ability. I have to ask, where do the voices that train the model come from? What are the ethics of performing through someone else's voice? What does it mean to own a voice or a timbre? In considering the challenge of intellectual property, the voice specifically in this new paradigm, as people think about how to control or foreclose usage, which I completely understand, I'm interested in kind of a different take, trying to frame this as a kind of identity play. So what if I made voice instruments available for people to perform through what Jay Springett calls the permissive IP, <laughs> the permissive IP approach? where people are given tools to experiment with my voice, and then the artist establishes a system to verify official usages of that voice. But for this reason, we set up a DAO, which is essentially a collective of online friends and supporters who can steward the voice and verify official usage. And uh, all of the panelists today, and me, myself, uh, are members of that DAO, along with some of the people in the audience as well. So, Hey, over to you to um, to kick us off today. Hello, everyone. Um, so if you are unaware of who I am, I'll just give a little bit of an intro. My name's Jay Springett. Um, I'm a writer and I work as a strategist. And my two kind of main um, interests are um, the creation of hybrid environments and world running. Um, and I'm very interested in kind of the insect intersection of those things and how, how that works with techno-social systems and narrative, etc. cetera. Um, and very nice to be here. Um, I was thinking, Matt, if you, I was wondering if you would give us an overview of uh, kind of the, the early conversations. I'm, I'm interested in the early conversations that you and Holly both had around Holly Plus before Holly Plus was was even like the idea. Sort of what conversations were you having before, you know, even even in the early days of when you were working on Spawn? Sort of like what was the genesis of of, of Holly Plus? Yeah, um, thanks and <clears throat> thanks everyone for being here. Yeah, so uh, uh, basically around about 2016. We started, we set out with the objective to make a record with a singing synthesizer. Um, and just from toying around with that stuff, which at the time was pretty nascent, you know, we were doing things like converting audio to spectrograms and then running spectrograms as if they were images and then <clears throat> converting those images back to audio. And then eventually it started to get a bit more sophisticated with 
um, with actually being able to train GANs on, on raw audio. Um, what became really clear in that process was that, you know, the training data itself was kind of where things were at. Um, and so even going back to like 2017 or something, you know, we were trying to put forward this message to people, um, you know, as we'll probably touch on and hopefully dismiss, there's so much um, discourse around the idea of these systems being somewhat autonomous or, or whatever. Um, but in actuality, you know, I felt, we kind of felt like that, you know, there's a danger of like underselling what's actually cool about these things where in actuality, you know, you train these systems on really, really large amounts of, of input and then you get really strange, wonderful things that come out of them. Um, and so we pretty early on saw an opportunity to make somewhat of a statement with this. And so for the record that we put together, the whole idea was we wouldn't train these GANs on any anybody that we didn't know and who we hadn't spoken to. And so the way it turned out ultimately is that all the voices that contributed to ultimately to the record proto were either, you know, were directly uh, compensated or attributed um, to give people maybe a shared sense of ownership in the voices that were that were ultimately represented there. Um, and so from that, you know, that kind of sparked an interest in us in really just thinking about, you know, what a clusterfuck, to be honest, um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> these systems are in terms of, you know, further abstracting away from uh, from the source of, of you know, where, where these ideas, where, where this work comes from. Um, and kind of in parallel, you know, we've been very involved in crypto conversations for some time. And, and one of the, the, the initial ideas that drew, drew me to crypto was this idea of provenance or kind of, you know, Ted Nelson's kind of dream of, of the web being perfectly attributable, this kind of stuff. Blockchains in many ways... Um, that was one of the early promises that I think drew a lot of people into the space was just this a different way of kind of organizing information um, and bringing transparency to often really complex processes. Um, and so if you basically combine those two things together, um, you get the the early embers of of Holly plus. Um, you know we had years ago uh, we're, we're quite close with with Trevor from Brud who put together the little Michaela project. We'd years ago discussed with him, you know, what would it mean with nascent DAO tooling, which at the at the time was was really not ready for prime time. You know, what what might it mean for all these people who are interested in this character, Michaela, to uh, feel a sense of ownership or stewardship over where she it um, it goes? Um, and and yeah, somewhere in the middle of that process, we're like, well, actually. You know, one of the really cool things about uh, Holly and I is that, you know, we kind of have the opportunity now with some IP that is, you know, somewhat notorious. Um, you know, Holly, for example, is present in the clip data set, right? She's present in the large clip model. And she passes a threshold of notoriety for her IP to actually really apply when we talk about these things. It's not academic, it's actually true. We kind of have an opportunity to, uh, you know, to maybe dog food some of these concepts with with this idea of Holly Plus, right? And and experiment with what it might mean to pragmatically like embrace all of the wonderful possibilities with these kind of new strange tools, and also maybe in the process, also you know, hint at what a standard might look like um, for a very very near future scenario. Um, I don't even think it's a near future. I think it's a, a present contemporary scenario. In which people are literally spawning works from, you know, from the style of or in the likeness of others, um, and yeah. So, so long story short, uh, we we kind of stumbled upon it by coming to, I think, very rational conclusions, um, and in that process, um, also identified a real uh, missing kind of dimension to the discourse, where you know. The, you can find a lot of very, a very lofty and in some cases very worthy discussions about the potential, uh, you know, economic or, or just general impact of, of machine learning, AI, uh, uh, in the world. But, but this particular point of how to, uh, properly 
uh, you know, properly uh, remunerate, um, attribute, um, not basically screw over um, the people whose whose work is contributing to these large models um, is is just a huge and in, interesting problem space that that everyone's kind of avoiding. Um, although I will say that in 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 the advent of of GitHub's Copilot. Um, you know, where for those who aren't familiar, there's now you know a, a pretty damn good, um, some somewhat automated uh, coding system trained on all of the code of people who've contributed to GitHub repos. All of a sudden, the technical community is very concerned about <laughs> about some of these IP issues. Um, they weren't so concerned when it was coming from the artist side, but now now maybe they're coming around to some of the the, the points we were trying to raise uh, many years ago. Right, so there's so you have kind of like mm, a couple of elements of the base material that that is not only making up Holly Plus, but in some sense it's wake, making up all of these different world models uh, that are involved in machine learning. So in the case of the Copilot, it's built on open source code that is then you know it's learned to code by 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 being trained on. You know all of the repos, open source repos, and one of the the, the IP questions there is that um, is it be, if it's been trained on a GAN, is it a uh, what's the word a transformative work or is it or is it downstream of the original code? So, yeah. so there's a kind of the licensing there is about is the code that's being spat out of Copilot GPL or you know MIT licensed or is it you know can you do anything you want with it? Um, and it's interesting. I kind of like I think it's interesting. That just because it's been put through a dream machine, <laughs> let's say, I guess is probably the way that I like like think about it. That that suddenly the the, the license or the you know the code the, the license that the the original material was trained on doesn't apply anymore. And I guess it's also the same with with Holly being present in the clip, um, in the clip world model as well, being recognizable as a she's a recognizable output. Um, right in 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 the it's yeah. been trained on all of these images, and I was just wondering, like, what are your thoughts on on that? I know that you you hammer this home quite a bit in in all of your work, but there is why do you think people don't want to think about this transformation of intellectual property and and the laws around it and what already applies, etc., just because it's being spat out of a dream machine? You know what makes that special in 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 the, yeah. I don't know. Or what assumptions were are built into AI research? It, it, it's a great question. I mean, I think there's a couple of things, right? Uh, first off, you know, the way we've approached it, and, and Ross brought this up earlier in trying to bring up the, you know, the sampling analog, which is actually a really imperfect analogy um, for for this, is that in a way taking the kind of paperclip machine metaphor, you know. <sighs> Many of our past practices, as we see it, um, were somewhat naive. They were somewhat forgiving. Um, the, the issue when you start getting into these really, really large, automated, incredibly powerful models is that ultimately any um, kind of small mistake or misconception from the past will be, you know, Kind of brutally, <laughs> br brutally, kind of sped run to to whatever conclusion is inherent uh, to to it, and so you know specifically on the Git on the GitHub Copilot uh, issue, you know there's this other dimension which is, you know when people when people uh, sign up for some licenses or agree to some things, I would expect that many people uh, publishing that code, you know, weren't thinking at the time that it could later be exploited in such a way. Um, and I mean exploited in, in kind of the neutral term, right? Like, um, and it's, it's kind of the same, I think, with freely available data online, right? Like um, images that have been posted and, and kind of scraped uh, uh, on, on Google or whatnot. It's like the licensing regime that people believe they were signing up for, um, I don't believe is really sufficient for, um, you know, I don't think people are anticipating this. Um, but yet, and, and I think so. One of the reasons people kind of avoid it is just that there aren't really speaking of models. I don't think there's really a mental model um, that is that is robust enough or has been established enough to really approach this topic, right? Um, and I'll give a good example for that. Um, 
you know, at the moment I'm very deep uh, thinking about this. Also with a, a fellow attendee, uh, Dirty Data, um, who has a lot to say about this. Um, at the moment, and you know, one dynamic that's kind of appearing in this kind of nascent AI space is, you know, battles between, let's say, uh, you know, Alphabet, Google, um, OpenAI, uh, Meta, these kind of big organizations that, you know, in a previous model represent, um, you know, kind of represent the enemy, right? They're the big, big, bad, heavily capitalized organizations. Um, and then on the other side, we have, you know, what to, to speak back to, you know, previous IP wars, what might be seen as analogous to completely open IP, completely open source romantic ideals from, let's say, the late 90s. Um, so organizations like Eleuther AI or whatnot, where if you, if you look at um, the way in which they're approaching things, there's a lot of commonality with the way they're kind of seeing their role in the world um, uh, versus the big bad enemy of Google or whatnot. Um, but one thing that, that, that in my mind kind of confirms that we need new models to approach, uh, new conceptual models to approach this problem is that in actuality, if you're concerned at all about, you know, uh, uh, being able to fruitfully benefit from the profits of your labor, whether that be, you know, uh, uh, writing code or... Um, or creating art, or simply, you know, uh, uh, you know, being able to exploit your right. likeness, right? Um, ne and neither. Thanks to me talking about come over. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> no problem. Uh, so, but but when you look at either sides of either side of those debate, kind of neither of those models is really sufficient. You know, like a kind of. The, the the punk uh, late nineties narrative of all information should be free or whatever, and then this kind of more corporate narrative, neither of which really have a good answer for this for this problem. And in fact, I think both could both could present a pretty perilous um, uh, 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 outcome for for everybody whose whose work is being is being um, is being is being uh, included included in these models. Um, and so yeah, so ultimately, I think a lot of people avoid it because. I see us making many of the same mistakes, and I don't see many great new conceptual models emerging to be able to uh, uh, to address this problem with any efficacy whatsoever. I hope that answers the question. Um, but that's yeah. the, but that's that's also what makes it exciting, though, right? Is like speaking to your permissive IP idea is that what's interesting about uh, permissive IP is that it's not unconditional, right? Like it's more like trying to build a robust conceptual framework for permissioned but permissive ways of approaching this stuff rather than shutting mm -hmm. it down or just completely nuking the entire creative economy <laughs> there's got to be like a there's a lot of really interesting work to be done in that middle but i don't think many people are aware of that yet and so holly plus as an attempt to kind of address as a first run at you know addressing these kind of issues that you've been talking about i guess one of the can you describe the technical, not necessary from a technical aspect, but as if you were drawing a map or, you know, just laying out the terrain of what does Holly Plus look like today in 2022 um, in terms of like, obviously there's the DAO, the Discord, but what are that technical elements are there um, that's involved? Yeah, so basically um, at the moment, so we started out with a model that um, was trained on Holly's processed voice, and the reason the processing uh, part is interesting is because you know Holly's quite uh, characteristic for having a very uh, you know alien vocal presence in a sense, right? You'll rarely hear her voice without some crazy process happening to it. And so, initially, we released an instrument with some uh, partners that never before heard sounds, where we're basically they've been working on a really cool polyphonic timbre transfer system where. Long story short, you can upload a poly piece of polyphonic audio, and then what will happen is it will be processed through this Holly voice model, and and it will return back to you, um, you know, a, a polyphonic uh, uh, rendering uh, in uh, from from what that particular model knows about Holly's processed voice. Um, where we are now, and some of the stuff we've been demoing, and and will be will be made more public in the coming months. Um, is we've also been working with. Um, some friends over at Voctro Labs, for those who are unfamiliar, Voctro Labs um, 
the Geordies, they're, they're the inventors of Vocaloid, right? Uh, many people don't know because they associate Hatsune Miku or whatnot um, with Japan, but, but a lot of that tech was licensed from a Catalonian genius, <laughs> Catalonian GSP, a DSP genius, uh, uh, Geordie Bonada. Um, and so from that, we now have a, uh, a singing synthesis system that basically takes music XML input, so you can upload a score, and what is returned is an incredibly realistic um, uh, singing voice of Holly. Um, and similarly with them, uh, we co-developed a system that will allow for that allows for anybody to be able to sing in Holly's timbre in real time. Um, and that's something that you know you can see a little bit in the video that Ross posted earlier. Um, we also just presented at the TED conference, which was a complete trip, um, uh, with somebody performing through uh, through Holly there. Um, so yeah, so at the moment, the idea is that there is a voice. Um, this training material is co-stewarded by the DAO. So those are friends and also people who've kind of contributed to this process in various ways. Um, uh, who and, and the approach that we've been taking is that ostensibly, you know, anybody ought to be free to use this voice however they please. Um, the voice, in a sense, is mimetic in that way. Um, however, the DAO and these kind of more boring technical components um, give us some way to kind of resist the tedious, I believe, often like deepfake discussion and say, well, no, through you know an open public address, um, a verifiable public address, the DAO will be able to validate some works that are made in Holly's voice and say, you know, hey, this is this is actually part of the canon, right? So if you hear, for example, a song in a couple of months that's using Holly's voice and it says something heinous that you know that nobody would want to be have associated with them, you'll be able to see and verify. Well, you know, is this just someone? playing around or is this something that represents Holly plus um, right and so the general idea there is you know trying to figure out some kind of a way um, some kind of a way to steward these these very permissive IP assets such as the voice um, and experiment with it you know um, and, and it's our position that I don't think that everybody would take the same approach but this appears to be one of the more interesting approaches that we could take obviously with Holly's blessing Right. And so Holly Plus as a kind of this 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 vehicle or this container for the stewards um and also kind of ownership or stewardship of the technology itself. Um obviously the first thing I mean you you were literally saying that the you know Vocaloid <laughs> the, the Vocaloid guys are involved. Um and Hatsune, Hatsune Miku obviously like comes comes to mind. And I'm struck by like the the similarities, and also in some sense the differences are important as well. But the, the similarities between Hatsune Miku as a, as a model and the way that Holly Plus works, um, I'm going to recommend to everyone in the chat uh, who's listening um, the Oxford Handbook of Music and Virtuality from 2016. Um, it's an absolutely awesome book about um, virtual music in, in in virtual reality. But the, there's a whole section on Hatsune Miku. And one of the things that I think that struck me about Hatsune Miku is uh, that the the, li the permissive licensing of the Vocaloid um, of the Vocaloid software itself, and how how anyone can make a track with Hatsune Miku's voice, but uh, because it, at one point it was like the most pirated, you know, <laughs> DSP uh, on the internet or VST file on the internet. But um, the, the thing that interests me is the way that the, the stewards of Hatsune Miku, um, whatever they're called, Sh Shuruku Media, off the top of my head, I forget what they're called. Oh, Krypton Future Media, that's what they're called. And how when you go to a Holly, when you go to a Hatsune Miku concert. Most of the songs that you're going to hear Hatsune, Hatsune Miku perform are actually fan made that have then been, you know, brought on board, and you know, licensing has been negotiated with the cre with the fan creator and the, the owners of the material. And I was I was wondering, like, is is this? Do you think that mo that model is 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 close to point to and say, yeah, Hatsune Miku is similar to Holly Plus, only one's run by a corporation and one's run by a group of people in a Discord. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, that's one thing we're really excited about. I mean, we've we've talked in the past about you know using DAO infrastructure 
<clears throat> to imagine what it might be like in a band with a thousand people or ten thousand people, right? And yeah. figuring that out too, of saying, well, one of the great benefits of this, and and again, this is this to take a really pragmatic economic angle on it, right? Like. Um, the deep fake narrative is that everything's outside of your control and that, you know, ultimately, you know, all this, uh, you know, let's say fan created media or casually created media will diminish, um, the value of the voice. And we're taking the exact opposite approach, um, which is very congruent with, with what you're describing with Hatsune Miku, right? It's like, no, in actuality, if we provide a really, really solid voice for people to use, um, that only in a sense kind of strengthens the the value of the original, which is very, in a way, kind of synonymous with, you know, some of the arguments that have been made around NFTs, right? Like, you know, if yeah. you go online, uh, people, you know, the, the, the funny joke is, you know, oh, well, I could just right-click and save that. And, you know, most people who I know who have contributed to NFTs from, from, inception are like no that's a feature right like the feature is that you 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 want for people to play around with and remix this ip because fundamentally then the original becomes 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 more valuable and so you know a lot of the things we've been thinking about are yeah like getting this tool into people's hands um encouraging them to encouraging them to experiment with it and also validating people's work right um and what i think is really funny you know when we spoke to trevor from uh, michaela on on the podcast we do we were talking a lot about this and how in actuality you know um this this kind of let's say crowdsourcing of ideas or inspiration or whatnot is just kind of how culture works it feels you know, beyond the kind of promotional language of how of how the culture industry works, this is just kind of how things happen, right? Like one easy thing to say, I think we we were talking about Rihanna or whatever, right? Is that in actuality a Rihanna record is is the product of often you know hundreds, thousands of people um, uh, contributing work, contributing a little bit to a beat here, contributing a little bit there, and in actuality, like abstracting the icon to be something virtual that. Um, that gives people the ability to 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 uh, uh, to work with it quite freely and and to coordinate around that, you know, in a weird way can kind of get more people paid, bring more transparency to just how the culture industry has worked has worked traditionally, um, and so we're particularly excited in those ideas. You know, like the, there's been some uh, recently we had a a sale of works, you know, which is very much a proof of concept, but you know, seventy artists made works with Holly's voice. Um, received a, um, they received half of the proceeds of those sales. Forty percent of the those sales went into the DAO, and basically, th- that money will be used to develop more tools so that people can use more stuff. And ten percent goes to Holly directly, right? So, we're very much playing with with economies here of thinking. Well, you know, how could you make it so that uh, how could you turn uh, uh, turn what what most people would frame as a dystopian story into a very generative kind of productive uh, 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 ecosystem that uh, you know that ensures that this voice and more tooling gets produced so that more people get to experiment and that fundamentally the original IP donator this being Holly um, can see kickback from you know from any uh, uh, from any profits made um, that she contributed a small part to. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, I think the Miku, the Miku approach is absolutely interesting. And I mean, and it's also time will tell, you know, um, time will tell, let's say in over a 10 year time horizon, um, whether or not kind of anonymous voices, and I don't want to say, uh, Hatsune Miku is anonymous per se, but she's certainly not tied to a human being you can go and meet or, or, you know, um, yeah. Will will end up being kind of competitive with with real people. I personally don't believe so. I think that they're two complementary uh, uh, concepts. But 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 we're very much focused on this side. That, that I think, and I think that you know, the we're approaching it with the voice because that's prim- you know Holly's primary instrument. Um, and what we've thought a lot of time, I spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, but we think a lot of these principles are generalizable to other areas too. Artistic style. Um, you know. Uh, likenesses in memes you know um mm-hmm. uh, so so i think that i think that as i said we're we're dog fooding a bigger concept with the ip that we have absolute control over which means we can be absolutely free to experiment with it yeah. and give give it to people yeah i'm quite um curious to hear um more about the I guess the sort of deeper history of um 
artificial pop stars, um, of which Holly Plus is a present example. Um, particularly, uh, Jay, I was quite interested to hear more about, um, well, hear, hear you kind of expand on some, some remarks you've made about the relation between Hatsune Miku and the Bunraku tradition. Then after that, it would be interesting to hear from you, Reza, um, about the, I guess, the even deeper history of um, that's at play here uh, to do with AIs and personhood. Uh, Jay, do you want to tell us a bit more about Hatsune Miku and Bun- Bunraku? Yeah. Um, so I think in terms of just like the idea of a virtual pop star, I think there's something interesting about it being somewhat of a meme in kind of the, in cyberpunk in general, right? Like there's like Idaru in William Gibson's, um, is it the Burning Chrome trilogy? I actually forget its name off the top of my head, but the, you know, there's the Idaru idol um, AI pop star that's like a key component of of that trilogy. And then there's also, I don't know if anyone's seen the film Macross Plus, but um, that's also like an anime about a virtual pop star. But one of the things that's important, I think, and also I think is missed on a lot of Westerners, quote unquote, in on Western culture, is that our dramatic traditions are very different. So in in the West, we know about the the term suspension of disbelief, right? Like you sit down in the theater and you're asked to suspend your disbelief in order to believe in what's going on on stage. And I think when Hatsune Miku first arrived, and I was still at university when, like 2004, and I wrote about her um, in my last year at university. But when when she first arrived, and also it was the beginning of the gorillas in Western culture, we had all of these arguments about whether Hatsune Miku or the gorillas were real, quote unquote, real or not. Um, and it, it just seems to me that that is completely like the wrong kind of question that we should be asking. Like, oh, people are being fooled fooled into going to see a virtual pop star who's a hologram, whose voice is made up of, you know, um, manipulated square waves or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's the wrong, it's the kind of a very, it's, it's, it's a wrong conversation to be having. But Hatsune Miku, as a pop star in, in, in Japan and kind of in the wider, um, in the wider world, especially in Asia, is understood as a product of Japanese bunraku tradition, which is kind of like not the same as, but it is a sister tradition to the more um, to to no theatre, which I think people are probably more aware of no theatre. But one of the, so but bunraku, um, if you were to go see it, essentially is three people, um, three men usually manipulating a puppet that's between three i reckon between two and three feet in height um and they have there's three people and they all wear black and they manipulate the puppet and they walk around the stage with the puppet so the puppet isn't it's unlike a a western or a british or you know puppetry to uh, tradition where people like in the Muppets where they hide you know the, the puppeteer in, in the Bunraku tradition is completely visible even though they wear black to sort of blend into the background on stage and what I think is interesting about that is that um is that the that you're not that Bunraku pu- puppetry is not trying to pretend that the puppets aren't being manipulated by people or you know um uh aren't being animated uh, or brought to life by three separate puppeteers, w- w- what you're actually being asked to do is, instead of suspending disbelief, you're being asked to believe in the in the puppet um, for the for the purposes of the performance. Which is and 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 Hatsune Miku is understood in that in that bunraku tradition, in that the strings and the puppeteers and everything that goes involved, that everything that is involved in, you know. Um, in, in bringing Hatsune Miku to life is visible or at least is known and understood by the audience. And I think that, that I think that's a really interesting, um, really interesting position, um, especially, you know, with, with, with relation to Holly plus and the Dow and, you know, the audience should understand that some media from Holly plus is going to be, you know, brought into the canon and, and given a stamp and other things will be, you know, disowned and, and not made official. And one of the things that I was, um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about puppetry in general, not just Bunraku, but like if we, if we, if we apply this to like a a wider idea of, of Holly Plus 
and that is that puppets are both internal mechanisms or they have internal mechanisms, but they also have external presence in the world um, or in the world of the stage. And for me, that, that, that seems really significant, especially also with like having, having mentioned little Michaela, little Michaela is, is both once a, you know, a puppet and, and, you know, who has mechanisms <laughs> to bring her to life in Unreal Engine, but also has a presence in the world and has a, has an edge or a boundary that can be interacted with um, on social media and stuff like that. But anyway, yeah, that was that's just a brief overview. I could talk about this for hours, but that's a brief overview of kind of the Bunraku puppetry tradition. And um, the the last thing I should probably say that I thought is um, that I wanted to mention actually is that Bunraku puppets. Um, Realism, realism is not the is also not the point. Um, a lot of puppet masters shy away from making realistic puppets because in the I think it's the 15th century, Bunraku puppeteers decided that the young like were aware of the Uncali Valley essentially, <laughs> and they were like, when you reach a certain point of realism, there's no point. You know, it should. It's all about it's the aesthetic that's more important than than the. Um, and the, the materials of the, the or the the mechanism that's being performed, and as such, you end up with situations where bunraku puppets don't have any feet, for example. One because they're being held at waist height by the puppeteers charging about the stage, but they don't have any feet because it ensures that the lines of the kimono are uh, continue down to the floor, and so the puppets can look, you know, four times as tall as they 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 usually would. And then the other part of that. That I find interesting is that um, I forget which arm it is, but the left or right arm of a Bunraku puppet is actually much larger, physically larger than the um, than than the other side, and that's because when you've got three puppeteers puppeting a puppet that's only two to three feet high, the one of the arms has to be larger because, from the perspective of the audience, it's actually it's physically further away from the puppet; it's actually behind the puppet. Um, and so the, the arm is manipulated. And I think that, that there's something interesting there about kind of the mechanisms of the puppet and the, and the way that the audience sees it, but also it's the perspective of the audience in what they're, in what we as like, you know, experiencing Holy Plus either live on stage or, you know, through in audio and even the people using it. There's a, there's something I think that's important about the perspective of the mechanisms and our perspective on them that we should probably also discuss as well. Anyway, yeah. So Reza, what's, um, what is sure. the dynasty of ideas or dynasty of inventions that, um, I suppose AI yeah. more generally, uh, AI pop stars belong to. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I would actually uh, would like to uh, kind of start from something else, but m gradually moving uh, uh, toward that topic, which uh, I think that you should again remind me in case that we I go off tangent. Uh, I will, don't worry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, excellent uh, materials. So I, I want uh, to uh, bring, uh, I mean, uh, sort of, uh, you know, a question that is relevant uh, to what Matt was talking about, uh, kind of uh, slowly uh, unfolding it um, uh, towards, you know, the, you know, this idea of uh, uh, AI and personhood, uh, which was a kind of the implicit, implicit uh, topic here. Uh, first, I, I mean, the, the, the first thing that I would like to uh, talk about and ask questions uh, about is, uh, you know, um, how the project of uh, Holly Plus is, um, you know, uh, being conducted uh, through DAO. Uh, and, you know, kind of going back uh, a little bit to the historical context of DAO, I know that... Uh, uh, Matt has been, you know, uh, looking at, you know, the, the, the problem of guilds, uh, you know, the kind of genealogy of uh, guild halls, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, Hanseatic League and so on and so forth. Um, trying to approach it from two different perspectives. Uh, one uh, would be, you know, my question for right now, and then the other one would be in relation uh, to AI. The first one 
will be about a kind of like the uh, political social, uh, you know, uh, understanding of guilds. Uh, so, I mean, first I would like to uh, ask this question from Matt uh, that. Uh, to what an extent uh, can we uh, see uh, DAOs, um, and particularly the sort of DAOs uh, and the configuration that Matt is interested in uh, with regard to this sort of you know, artistic practices and forms of production, uh, to what extent uh, DAO uh, in general, and in particular in the case of uh, Matt and Holly, uh, can be extended to, uh, you know, the paradigm of guilds and guild halls uh, that, you know, began, uh, uh, it boomed uh, during the Middle Ages and uh, you know, kind of uh, faded away um, um, through, you know, uh, various sort of failures, uh, you know, in the 18th century, uh, 1700s. Um, I mean, people who are familiar, you know, with, with the stories of, you know, uh, economic crisis in the Middle Ages and, you know, the rise of the Hanseatic uh, League, uh, 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 you know, they have heard uh, stories about uh, that, um, to the contrary of uh, some uh, later uh, accounts um, made by historians uh, who try to rehabilitate the idea of guilds. Guilds were actually, you know, uh, uh, part of what you might call to be the dark side uh, of uh, technological innovation and uh, market and uh, economy, uh, so to speak. Uh, there is a great book, uh, I mean... Anything that she has written is actually great on this topic by uh, Sheila Ogilvy uh, on, on basically uh, uh, the idea of guild and her responses to rehabilitation theories uh, of, uh, you know, guild paradigm. Um, one of the uh, main um, points of criticism that uh, she um, points out to is... Uh, that guilds uh, were essentially driven by um, a kind of bloated social capital, uh, where basically these social capital were, you know, uh, manifesting in terms of norms, uh, you know, um, uh, kind of um, um, a certain sort of uh, openness. Uh, sorry, a certain sort of closure uh, with regard to innovation or resistance to innovation under the guise of openness, under the guise of openness. That essentially social capital, precisely because they had a certain sort of, you know, intra, uh, um, basically, um, intra, uh, inter, intersubjective dynamics, these sort of norms that were basically uh, entrenched by the members of the guild and their you know, their policies, uh, these uh, social capitals uh, tended to uh, essentially ultimately exclude, uh, you know, external innovations and create points of resistance. So in the beginning, the social capital was, and we, you can say the social capital uh, in the medieval times is a, uh, you know, kind of like... Um, uh, an old proto-paradigm for social networking today when we are talking about internet and web tree and so on and so forth. Uh, so the, the uh, social capital at the beginning uh, was a positive factor precisely because it was lowering the cost of collective action. Uh, but uh, uh, and it created uh, for uh, many uh, you know, people who were dealing with guilds and also guild members, this kind of fallacy that, uh, you know, kind of uh, expansion of uh, social capital uh, has uh, emancipatory uh, uh, in this sort of guild uh, paradigm, has emancipatory implications. Um, really eliding the distinction between, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, uh, 
social uh, equality uh, or equity and uh, economic equity. Um, and this, uh, you know, uh, we can we can see it uh, today too that you know um, uh, certain DAOs, uh, despite their uh, you know, or uh, you know claims to this sort of um, openness, at least not unconditional openness, but a kind of uh, what you might call to be uh, egalitarian openness. Um, uh, are essentially embedded uh, within a kind of um, highly ossified uh, social networking system. Uh, I mean, Ross knows that, for example, for this particular book that we are uh, today, we have a conversation for, uh, the, the crowdfund just didn't work, right? Uh, uh, precisely because... Uh, uh, it was not already being done within the established uh, social networking systems, or uh, it didn't have the social capital, so to speak. Um, so a great project, I mean, I'm not saying that this is a great project, uh, I hope that it will be, but a great project can simply be dismissed and uh, underfunded uh, precisely because it doesn't function within the established uh, uh, regime of the social capital. Uh, and to that extent, uh, so we come with a, a very uh, kind of the dark side of guilds and can actually be talked about also in terms of DAO, uh, you know, uh, the, the entrenchment uh, of social capital and the sort of fallacies that ultimately it makes illusions of um, openness, uh, egalitarianism, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so to that extent, uh, yes, I would like to um, <clears throat> uh, ask this question, uh, you know, uh, from... Uh, Matt, uh, you know, so again, to what extent uh, DAO in general and the sort of DAO that he is interested in can be really uh, um, extended to the, you know, genealogy of uh, guild and guild halls? And is it really uh, an informative or... Um, kind of helpful way of understanding how DAO functions or not. And the second question, uh, again, in conjunction with this sort of uh, socioeconomic uh, side of things, guild and DAO, uh, is that given, again, uh, you know, the, um, the kind of uh, the problem of social capital uh, in, in, you know, guild and DAOs, um, to what extent uh, DAO, or for that matter, guilds, uh, can uh, encourage uh, and foster uh, technical or technological innovations uh, where market or the established systems uh, of you know, technological innovation uh, fail? So with that said, uh, Matt, I would love Honestly, to Honestly, that, that was great. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so I'm going to end up agreeing with you a lot. Um, yes, yeah, so, so to start at the beginning, I mean, to absolutely acknowledge, you know, I wrote a piece, this was th three, or, three or four years ago, discussing DAOs in the context of guilds. And at the time, long story short, like my conclusion was that, you know, organizations like Google, kind of data harvesters, ultimately are kind of cartographic entities, right? They own, um, they they own and kind of capture large amounts of of the web. They 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 build maps of the web and they commandeer them. And the analogy I was making at the time was that, you know, the guilds, this kind of other history of let's say, uh, the Hanseatic League, um, you know, running from, from uh, Lübeck and you know, all the way through to Guildhall in London, um, 
was ostensibly, you know, a network, a cartel network. Um, and let's be clear, it is a cartel um, a so network. Artistic. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, um, um, but but an ability for artisans to, you know, making the distinction between, let's say, a guild and a union. Um, a union usually is kind of like a, a you know a group of employees under a certain regime or whatnot. But the, the, the slight distinction that I made, at least in that piece, is that guilds were artisans kind of, you know, establishing through social capital, uh, as you put it, or, or, you know, through professional affiliation, you know, a, a cartel in which they were able to negotiate prices at the time with, with empire, right? Um, which is a slight distinction from unions, even though they have some corollaries. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And, and so to speak to this wider point, um, First off, when you're talking about nascent DAO infrastructure and the things that have been funded and the things that haven't been funded, I think viewing them as a cartel, for better and worse, is absolutely accurate. Um, it's no, you know, and I'll I'll be very transparent about this. I mean, you know, I, I personally, many of the projects that we've that we've participated in, I believe, have benefited greatly from us just being in the crypto community a lot longer than other people. And generally speaking, many of the projects that that have come along. Um, that have come along and maybe seen even greater success often do so in flattering many of the you know the the kind of inherent goals of a concentrated uh, concentrated goals of of people specifically in that community and so I'm under no um, false pretenses over you know the the egalitarian nature of DAOs as we have seen them today. Um, and so I think that that's a completely legitimate criticism. Um, what I will say is that, um, you know, there's two things going on here, right? There's the, on the one hand, I'll concede, and I also kind of lean into in some sense, that framing DAOs uh, as being almost kind of like dirty tactics you know, this is not a clean, like, and, I, and I believe this is synonymous with crypto as a whole. I don't believe that, you know, pursuing these kind of quick, dirty methods to try and capture back some agency over the web is a clean idea. Um, and I think we've seen this a little bit when, you know, you go online and I've participated in, in way too many, into way too many of these discussions. You know, if you were to go out and try and, um, and try and propose a, a, a more egalitarian, a, you know, a, a, a construct from scratch, a an ideal of how things would work. Um, I don't believe that, you know, I mean, there's some corners of crypto that might apply there, but you might opt to do something different, right? You might opt to do something transnationally state-based or whatever it might mean. Um, so it, it, in my mind, just on this particular point of, of DAOs being cartels and it being, in a sense, a kind of dirty tactic, um, I don't say dirty pejoratively. I just mean it's kind of, you know, it, it's a very like, a, <laughs> um, it, it's fraught in some ways. Is that I believe some of these tools, um, to speak to your latter point about, you know, the ability to kind of brute force uh, certain principles, the ability to brute force certain objectives, certain technological developments, um, meets the meets the scale or the the the. Um, the the urgency of the situation we find ourselves in, right? And this going back to that original piece um, is very much in in you know my personal position is, is that when we look at the fang and we look at these kind of now almost unseatable um, uh, data harvesters, organ very centralized uh, 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 players that that will dictate the future of the web and continue to dictate uh, uh, and continue to put forward a very clear uh, future of the web. Is that for me personally? I, I I'm not squeamish about some of the the the, the cartel like nature um, that appears in crypto, even though I accept the criticism and and, and actually take take great issue with it uh, myself. That being said, the one interesting thing I think um, about crypto specifically, you know, when you're talking about open uh, open blockchains, open public blockchains, um, is that when you're talking about, for example. Uh, some of the issues related to, uh, you know, IP remuneration, uh, attribution, wanting to be more permissive with the IP. Um, one of the great affordances made by this new infrastructure is, for example, this idea of trustlessness, right? Like if you wanted to, as we're experimenting with, if you wanted to have a bunch of people contribute to a project 
under a kind of shared rule set, irrespective of that rule set being more or less egalitarian, depending on which DAO you're talking about or whatever, um, these tools are incredibly useful. So in a sense, um, I, think, I think it's kind of both, right? I, I think that on the one hand, in, this, in the crucible of the, the very kind of fiery <laughs> uh, crucible in which a lot of this tech has been forged and a lot of the money flying around, undoubtedly there are some issues with the most kind of zealous um, egalitarian claims around crypto, and, and I'll, I'll concede that. That being said, I do believe that a lot of the infrastructure being built is incredibly useful. Um, and, you know, to, to, I, I published a piece recently, this was more to do with NFTs. Um, you know, in my mind, um, I, I called it the shock of the nude, um, in my mind, also, the, the, the fact that many, let's say, existing inequities or existing unusual practices are being displayed out in the open um, uh, is also, in my mind, uh, uh, really, really positive, you know. So, so in, in the sense of saying, you know, it, it is kind of my belief, perhaps it's cynical, that, you know, at least in my dealings with the culture industry or anything professional, that, that cartels are, in, in a sense, kind of a reality, in, in most strata in life, social capital cartels, to speak directly to your point, Reza, um, are kind of a reality. And so in many ways, one of the arguments I was making in this recent piece around NFTs is that many people are confusing, um, are confusing, you know, witnessing these dynamics uh, for something new, when in actuality, what is happening is that existing inequities and this existing social capital existing cartels are being denuded right that they're they're being made they're being made nude for us to be able to read and it's my great hope that you know that that as a kind of intervention um will at least give people more ammunition with which to construct potentially more egalitarian uh, 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 scenarios, you know. And and I can say on our side, you know, when when it comes specifically to Holly Plus, I mean, we've, we've made nothing from Holly Plus. I mean, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, but but what's kind of interesting there is, you know, I'll go back to it. I say this quite often, right, is like when you're talking about open public uh, legible blockchains, right, like I don't personally believe that they're going to make anyone fairer, but I do believe that it makes fairness more transparent, right? And so... Uh, I would consider Holly Plus to be definitely on this kind of, on a more idealistic, uh, uh, harmonious tip in terms of how we approach it. But you'll find no uh, objection to me that that you know the way in which these things have panned out have not necessarily uh, you know outside of some corners um, have not necessarily kind of uh, radically transformed. Um, you know the, the 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 regime of of social capital and 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 cartels as we know them, uh, 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 at least in the creative economy. I, I think that, and time will tell. And time will tell. But 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 as far as your your critique goes, um, I haven't actually read the Sheila Ogilvy book. I've, I've 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 watched a talk of hers, and it's actually very hard to find anyone who says anything positive about guilds. <laughs> um, but. Uh, uh, but yeah, but but I take all your points really well. I think it's I think it's a really great, a really great angle to to try and dissect some of the stuff. Uh, well, it'd be thank a good you. moment to um, to uh, ask you to turn to the question of the uh, the dynasty of inventions point. Yes, yes. Oh, first the the second the second. Uh, um, uh, question coming back, I said that the one, the socioeconomic one, and then the other one that I left, and then I come back and probably we get to that whole idea of, you know, uh, AI, uh, um, if we understand it in a, in a you know, a different sort of way, yes, it, it, it can be understood as a kind of, you know, um, the un unfolding of a dynasty of, you know, ideas and, and, and problems. Uh, so I first uh, thank you, Russ, uh, for reminding me. Uh, so yes, uh, Matt. Uh, yeah, I completely. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree uh, with you know. Yes, the dairy, uh, the dairy business, or uh, uh, is very, very good actually. Um, so long as we kind of uh, treat it neutrally as a neutral phrase. Is actually a very good way to uh, put it. Is essentially, you know, the kind of like a commander's, uh, so-called commander's intent in warfare. You know, yeah. that eighty percent. You always need to have eighty percent strategy, and the strategy usually is benevolent, right? 
But the 20% or at least 10 to 20% you need to be reserved for tactical operations. And tactical operations require, you know, um, messiness, uh, particularly. And uh, I think that, yes, that this is actually a very uh, good approach, so long as, you know, we have that sort of... Um, uh, what you might call a strategic benevolency, uh, also uh, the context of a strategic benevolency in conjunction with the uh, what you might call to be the tactical uh, side of things. Uh, um, coming back to the idea of, uh, before I uh, pose my second question uh, with regard to your specific vision of DAO and Holly Plus, um, um, it seems that uh, oh by the way um, um, in terms of if there is actually a positive you know account of um, um, guilds uh, yes there are actually uh, if to my mind uh, there is there is a book on uh, 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 prehistory of uh, I can't remember the title I think it's called pre uh, Economic Prehistory and the Rise of Guilds or something like that by uh, Stephen Epstein. Um, that is actually, uh, you know, quite a very, gives a very uh, flowery, positive accounts of guilds and, you know, their uh, history in Middle Ages uh, up to late Renaissance. Uh, guilds, I think, uh, and you can see it with Tao, uh, that, I um, mean, that there was also a reason other than, you know, um, the kind of, um, you know, kind of cartelization of uh, in innovations and uh, approach to uh, profits and training and learning and all that sort of stuff. Uh, there was actually another primary reason for the rise of guilds, and that was, uh, and we can see it, a different version of it today. Uh, initially, uh, guilds uh, started to rise, uh, you know, in Europe, particularly Germany and France. Uh, Ger German and French guilds, as uh, you know, were different from the ones that you know you, you see later in UK. Uh, the, uh, the the reason was that. Uh, before the rise of the guilds, uh, there was a fundamental asymmetry, you know, uh, of information between producers and uh, consumers. Uh, that's uh, because of this asymmetry, uh, consumers were unwilling uh, to actually uh, embrace a new product. Uh, or, uh, and by virtue of that, then producers were also unwilling or resisting uh, quite actively, uh, you know, um, adoption of new techniques and ways of production. Uh, guilds uh, uh, initially began to, uh, you know, kind of mitigate this uh, informational asymmetry. Uh, to the point that it kind of created a more uh, balanced or certain environment, uh, environment of certainty for consumers to be able to, uh, you know, um, feel kind of like as if they are so, somehow involved and they are uh, capable of, you know, uh, buying or consuming certain sort of products that they wouldn't otherwise, you know, uh, choose, which by extension... Uh, led, uh, you know, the producers inside the guild uh, to have a certain sort of freedom uh, of adoption of techniques, materials, uh, you know, uh, distribution, so on and so forth. But uh, as, uh, you know, again, uh, critics have pointed out this asymmetry again um, uh, resurface um, in a different sort of uh, framework, the informational asymmetry becomes um, 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 what you might call to be uh, the Achilles heel of uh, the, the guild uh, framework 
to the extent that uh, what goes on in the guild is quite, uh, you know, um, a kind of a black box operation. You know, the, the, the mechanisms, the, uh, the distribution, at least to the, the people who are inside the guild, it's, you know, uh, to an extent it is transparent, but only to the people who are what you might call to be the adapters uh, rather than the, uh, uh, the, the members of the guild. Uh, it is transparent, uh, or at least they know a semblance of how it works. But to consumers, again, it is like a black box. And we kind of see it uh, also in, in uh, you know, kind of the DAOs too, that the, uh, it seems that one of the, um, um, you know, negative points that might eventually uh, uh, crop out is this sort of black box uh, operation uh, that only certain uh, you know uh, um, functionaries of the DAO be able to figure this out even to the member of a DAO people might not actually see how it works so the informational asymmetry this time uh, is not simply between uh, the producer and the consumer uh, or the clients or regular audience, but this is actually between the what you might call to be the core mechanisms uh, of guild or DAO uh, and uh, members of DAO, uh, and then ultimately uh, the people who are outside of it, um, and that informational uh, you know asymmetry again brings back to that sort of, uh, you know, um, certain problems that, you know, existed uh, or preceded uh, DAO or guild uh, and for which DAO or guilds uh, were, you know, developed to address those problems. And now there are actually, um, you know, kind of uh, bolstering those problems uh, or issues, uh, but under a different guise, in a different sort of context. Uh, so uh, what do you think of that? Uh, I mean, before I get to the second question that I was supposed to ask you, I mean, in terms of the sort of black box operation, uh, and you, you can see it also that is uh, one of the main immediate uh, consequences of this sort of informational asymmetry uh, is an impulse to uh, propagate a DAO alternative. So, you know, you have a diversification of guilds, you have diversification of DAOs, uh, but diversification doesn't really ultimately address uh, the problem of informational asymmetry. It just uh, kind of, uh, you know, dilutes it. You know, you can see it in the, particularly in the history of French guilds, uh, which is called Corps, uh, Corps de Métiers, uh, that uh, precisely because of the informational asymmetry that has start to happen within the uh, context of guild, um, guild, starts to, uh, you know, pro proliferate. Uh, for example, if you have a guild of, uh, you know, metal workers, then there is like 300 of different sort of guilds within that guild. And again, subsidiary guilds within those, uh, you know, uh, sub guilds, which all actually convolute, uh, you know, uh, the the kind of the merits uh, and the capacities uh, and the, uh, the potentialities of, of uh, uh, guilds and what were they supposed to do, what problems uh, they were supposed to address. Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I think honestly that's fascinating. When, when you were describing the issues with information asymmetry and this idea, just to, just to recap as, as I understood it, um, you know, I see so many uh, corollaries with with where things were. Right, you're you're suggesting that you know uh, there was a lack of adoption of of new ideas, um, a lack of incentive for producers to adopt new new uh, technologies. I see that as being very synonymous with 
let's say, a stagnation that was setting in, uh, particularly in uh, the the particularly developers and people uh, involved in the web were very very sensitive to, in let's say the mid tens, right? A, a roundabout like preceding, I'd say, like <clears throat> the 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 emergence of of the Ethereum network, um, and yeah, absolutely that you know. We also find ourselves now in a time where, you know, as you said, th- that information asymmetry can can also be compounded by just convolution of of concepts or ideas. I mean, bringing to mind again this kind of when you, when you were talking about earlier with with social capital, this idea that you know once invited in, um, I mean, crypto is famous famously kind of. Uh, impenetrable right the the, the 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 language it has its own it has its own language it has its own technical language it has its own concepts um and of course it, it presents a, a little bit of a paradox <clears throat> i was talking about this it was around about a year ago um where in a sense you know if you go back to if you go back to the early 2010s many of the i think very valid critiques that were being leveled at you know, a, a rapidly stagnating web, a rapidly kind of centralized web, was you know a critique that people were not able to participate in the upside of of this invention. That you know companies were getting so big that new emergent ideas were being squashed. Um, uh, uh, and one of the the cool kind of defensible ideas that came out of that was this idea of. You know, what if we were to have a web where more people participated in its creation, right? Um, and I, I went on like a long tweet thread about this a year ago that I thought was criminally underlooked. Um, but the <clears throat> the idea, basically, that um, you know, Web One people, you know, most people were not uh, kind of aware of its creation. You know, something you maybe, if you were a specialist, you you knew about, but it was kind of happening in halls that were removed from you. Uh, web two, despite the fact that many of the origins of Web two as a concept come from the open source community, it was it was in its nature just more accessible by virtue of the fact that the internet existed, so people could hear about these things. But it was still very specialist, um, and and so Web three, in in essence, is the first <clears throat> the first internet um, that is inviting people in, um, and and it creates a strange paradox in a way. Where you know this kind of egalitarian impulse, um, once you invite people in, and the vernacular is crazy, and some of the at least let's say the, the legitimate uh, concepts or discourse that are happening um, is exposed to people, um, they're often lost in that um, and vulnerable, right? And, and that's what we see, um, you know, with you know exit liquidity scams and pump and dumps and misdirection and. And just general confusion. I mean, there's people who've, who've lost a great deal of money in this, and I don't think they even know how. You know, uh, <clears throat> um, and so it, it, it's a huh? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, please go on. Yeah. So, so it, it's interesting that, that you could characterize that as an information asymmetry in a way where, where you know, the the, the very kind of like let's say idealistic gesture of having a lot of people, one, be able to participate in the upside of the projects that they contribute to, which I think is a defensible position, um, can also open up this kind of paradoxical thing where it's, it's worse for them to do that, right? That actually what you want is, uh, is not to, uh, may, maybe not to expose people to risk or to, or to some very confusing or, or oftentimes kind of like uh, misdirecting uh, 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 concepts, um, and so, yeah. So it, it's odd that you know the more you involve people early on, the more weirdly alienated they can be, right? It's very, it's a very, it's a very strange paradox. Um, but it's also just kind of endemic to to this new internet, right? To this this new parallel uh, concept of an internet. It, it's endemic in the sense that it, it it can't be put back in the box. But but that but I think that critique holds really well. Um, I, I, uh, yeah. Um, and, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I can't believe that I'm actually trying to make a Darwinian metaphor, and I'm saying metaphor meaning that it cannot be overextended. That is the whole point of a metaphor, because then otherwise it would be, uh, you know, uh, a dogma. Uh, you see, um, so we are essentially for Web three. Do you agree that we are going 
phase uh, where basically uh, using the Darwinian metaphor, essentially it is about, uh, you know, kind of like an over-diversification or, or prolif over-proliferation of, you know, kind of uh, infrastructures. But precisely because this it has an over-proliferating uh, tendency, uh, there is, you know, a massive amount of room uh, for failures, uh, you know, misguidedness, uh, um, scams, so on and so forth. Uh, and you see that basically the proliferation of infrastructure in that sense uh, by itself uh, hardly means uh, any sort of uh, uh, emancipatory or egalitarian uh, connotation. So long as uh, it has not been complexified, where we are thinking about this is why thinking about uh, you know the Darwinian paradigm, uh, we see that uh, that the curve in the evolutionary uh, uh, you know trajectory uh, it goes through a, a diversification uh, of morphogenesis and so on and so forth. Uh, but it then sharply uh, comes down to the point that it almost becomes asymptotic. Uh, that precisely because com complexification requires entrenchment and stability. Uh, and that cannot be uh, maintained uh, and cannot be achieved uh, through mere diversification. So that's why we see that in evolution... Uh, particularly the complexification of nervous system, that where diversification is actually being curtailed. So do you think that, uh, are we in that phase of uh, kind of um, proliferation before th there is a sharp uh, crash or a sharp decline uh, in, in this sort of proliferation and when do you think that we might actually get into that complexification of infrastructures? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, it, <clears throat> it brings to mind, we had um, some very clever people on the podcast not long ago who are building this thing called Context, which I think is also quite, quite an interesting remedy to some of these issues because what they're trying to do is basically build a kind of human legible layer on top of public blockchains. So basically trying to turn abstract information into something that people can read, right? Um, speaking to, you know, cartels and, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and social capital and stuff to try and make these dynamics that, that are technically uh, available to view on, on chain and try to make them actually legible to, the, to a regular person. Um, in that discussion, we talked a little bit about how, you know, uh, speculation um, and the inherent nature of, you know, when we're talking about blockchains outside of, you know, my particular interest in them, you can't disentangle um, them from the fact that, you know, the first, the first utility for these chains was trading, right? Like speculation, these are forged in speculation. Um, and then as we've seen over, uh, over the past few years, there have been certain, you know, in boom bust cycles, there's always been kind of like a concept that, that has led, you know, initially... Uh, let's say in 2017, even though Ethereum technically was an ICO, in 2017, the, the proliferation of the idea of being able to uh, crowdfund uh, and, and do token swaps uh, with large groups of people in order to support ideas um, was what you saw in a sense was kind of a speed running of scenarios, right? Where in that crucible of intense speculation, um, going back to dirty business, we saw simultaneously both you know, an absolute proliferation of scams, um, an absolute proliferation of confusion and just kind of bedlam, chaos, um, and also, uh, you know, a number of a number of projects that that stu stuck to their word um, and produced crucial infrastructure that then uh, provided the foundation for the next uh, boom cycle, which you know happened to coalesce around this idea of an NFT. Um, and, and similarly, there we've seen this insane kind of like chaotic speed running of every potential exploitation in, in the neutral term of, of that file type. Um, and what remains, but at the end of that battle, in a sense, 
is are some core infrastructural habits or concepts that you know build the next layer um and so yeah so where i stand being somewhat neutral about this because i think i think that the the pitfalls of it are are, are self-explanatory or self-evident um where i stand is is in a sense this kind of very dirty sausage factory um <clears throat> this this insane kind of speed running of all potential scenarios because there are economic incentives um for people for people coming into the space is you know uh, one one would hope that at some point this ends up stabilizing into you know for want of a better term uh, utility right um and i think that's what everyone calls for is that you know for me having trained my gag reflex over many years now um i'm pretty laser focused on you know where these tools if properly impl implemented and if secure enough um can be deployed to uh you know to 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 create the possibility for a uh, new kind of technical infrastructure that will allow for new habits to emerge and i'm still pretty convicted on that however there's no shying away from the fact that the 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 way in which it has occurred um is is in this kind of crucible of, of brutal speculation and misdirection um and and what i think is quite interesting about this i was on a panel a couple of weeks ago you know where someone because let's say in the crypto space, so those are familiar, will know. But there's a, a, it's quite common for people to to kind of make apologies for this. Um, even though I can I can acknowledge a lot of the the, the negative sides of it, um, where you know people will say things like you know, oh well, we, the problem is just proof of work. We need proof of stake. You know, there's all these kind of easy ways to kind of like alibis to to overlook the fact that maybe a really kind of um, brutal and, and sobering uh, insight that in actuality, if we want to reach any kind of stable, let's say more equitable scenario, that can only be forged in some ways it, it married to this tumult of speculation, financial incentives, so on and so forth. It could be both, you know, and yeah. that's kind of my position. That's kind of my position is that in actuality, you know, it could be that a whole lot of horrible things happen and that by the end of it, we're actually in a better position than had they not, um, which is not to defend the horrible sides of crypto, but that could well be the really uncomfortable conclusion from all of this. <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a very actually a healthy uh, stance. I uh, tend to agree with uh, your position here. And I will, uh, so this actually brings me to the question that, uh, I mentioned uh, with regard to Holly Plus and uh, you and Holly's, uh, you know, vision of DAO, and maybe we should have a, 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 a you know short break, and then I will ask this question. And this question is not just for you, for Jay, and also for Ross, and also for the audience. And then, which is essentially, we bring the whole idea of you know this whole uh, uh, you know. Um, Kind of um, uh, DAO as a factory for techniques, uh, you know, and uh, open, uh, you know, source self or open source artwork and so on and so forth, and then kind of tied back to AI. Uh, so yes, maybe we should have Ross, if you don't uh, mind, uh, we'll have a uh, you know uh, refreshment. Uh, something break and then we reconvene in like five ten minutes yeah that sounds good should we make it ten minutes cool, pass. great well ten yeah minutes, let's, let's, let's reconvene in ten minutes then okay see you then yeah
Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? I'm just trying something out. Do I sound like Holly? Yes. <laughs> Let's let's keep 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 that on for the rest of the uh, rest of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think yeah. Discord doesn't quite like the uh, uh, it's the like it's noise gate that it's using. I think it's clipping the beginning and end of all of the Holly Plus voice. It's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Overzealous noise gate on Discord. <laughs> I can turn it off if it's annoying. It's really annoying. Really We'll start again in a couple of minutes. Um, sure. About, and probably in about five minutes, thereabouts. Yeah, I like the uh, dairy sausage factory. Germans would be proud. <laughs> yeah, you that particular <laughs> Oh. 
Mm. We should use this opportunity to plug our new centre course a bit more, Jay, um, and explain how it is going to differ from the kind of originally advertised version of it. Yes, yeah, so if anyone's interested, did you guys it? Hello? What was that? Did you guys change it, the, the description or something? We did, yeah, we did. We We... Decided that there were there was sort of good opportunity here to make this not just a course about theory of DAOs, um, but also a kind of design, uh, kind of DAO design course or a kind of speculative design. Did you course. send it to Raphael? Yeah, yeah. So this was part of the because uh, it was originally meant to be the four sessions, and then now it's going to be eight sessions. Okay, superb. Uh, uh, when does your class start exactly? When does the what? When does the class? I think the first one is the 18th of August. It's, the, it's whatever is the second last Thursday of August. Okay, uh, I will, um, I will uh, WhatsApp uh, Raphael, and if he hasn't put it online, I will say that uh, to do it. Yeah, great, yeah, because it would be good for... Um, I think we've already got quite a few people signed up, actually, but... Um, We'd be, would be good for, uh, for for kind of those who hopefully your class is going to know what they're out. getting into. <laughs> you didn't hear that. I said that hopefully your class, your seminar, will fund other instructors and the new center for the years to come. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, our, our kind of uh, our grand aim for this. Um, so just to explain, the kind of focus of it now is is um, in large part on uh, participants designing their own DAOs, their own kind of speculative DAOs. Um, Superb. And Superb. In enough detail that they're imagining their future histories um, viewed from the perspective of the year 2035. They're kind of rolling up the theory side of it into, into that, which is, I guess, more practical. Of course, what we're really hoping is that participants come up with uh, good enough ideas for DAOs, ideas that they find exciting enough that they then realise that there's really not much of a, you know, a kind of leap for them to actually um, establish them and make them, you know, make them really exist. Excellent, excellent. So maybe uh, something or other that will, yeah. Um, maybe uh, we should also, uh, I mean, if you are interested, you and Jay, um, or, and Matt, I don't know, uh, we can, uh, you know, after your class, we can also have, you know, one session, a uh, public session for everyone, uh, you know, uh, just, you know, kind of a recap of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. I think that would be really nice, actually, to, to sort of everything together and reflect, I guess. I think that would be really nice. Excellent. Uh, Matt, uh, the, the sausage factory that you depicted here is not that bad. Uh, I mean, it's not as bad as what Bismarck had, uh, you know, had seen. But I mean, if you think that the <laughs> factory is bad, you haven't seen a slaughterhouse, European slaughterhouses. <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, 
the, the censorious nature of, um, of uh, Dolly 2 might not let me go that far. <laughs> yeah, they're very, they're very careful. They're very careful with slaughter. <laughs> <laughs> Who has seen uh, George Franjo's The Blood of the Beast? I'm not. It's a no. very great movie and extremely controversial for its time. Uh, it is essentially. Uh, uh, you know, the process from uh, uh, Paris slaughterhouses to a sausage factory. Oh, this is for oh, you. I, have, I haven't seen this. Yes. Yeah, I, I recognize the name now. Yeah. Yeah, nice. I'll have to check that out. Should we, uh, should we resume? Sure. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for staying with us. Thank you. Uh, oh, uh, 